in the R&P webinar service uh, set of talks that we have. Uh, today's talk is uh, by Professor Pankaj Sethya. And the talk is going to be on, as you can already see the slides, the takeoff of open source software, a signaling perspective based on community activities. Um, a little bit about uh, Professor Sethya. He is uh, a professor at, in the IS area at IME and also the founding chair of the Center for Digital Transformation again here at IME. And uh, his studies revolve around organizations and how they leverage IT applications and digital capabilities for uh, superior organization performance. And he has a long list of publications in leading ICE journals. Uh, I won't go into a long list of uh, his achievements because there are plenty and uh, you got a quick synopsis in the announcement for the talk. Uh, regarding questions, I think um, Professor Sethya has said, in case you have any clarificatory questions, you're welcome to ask them as the talk is going on. But for um, longer questions, uh, it would be good if you can maybe type them into the chat window and uh, we'll wait till the end of the talk and then uh, he'll take those questions, right? Okay, um, so over to you, Pankaj. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kavita. Uh, very uh, nice, uh, saying very nice words. Uh, we, uh, and thanks everyone who's here. And uh, uh, some people are still trickling in. Um, so, you know, thank you all for taking the time. It's near uh, to your uh, end of the uh, office and hour. So I appreciate you coming uh, back. And so, uh, get started with the talk, what uh, we are going to talk about today is, uh, you know, as the title suggests, um, you know, what is the, uh, what are the factors that influence takeoff of open source products? And just a brief background of this project, the uh, talk I'm going to give is based on the, uh, you know, research that we published recently although did not start recently, it's been a while, but we published recently in MIS Quarterly, which is one of the leading journals in the domain of IS. And it is related to the open innovations as um, you know, the main theme uh, of talk. So uh, let me get started by showing you the slides. So I hope you guys can see my slides. Um, yes, anyone? Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. So, uh, you know, the idea of open source um, has become very mainstream now. Uh, part of it is that there are a lot of products that are now developed in open source mode, which to some extent has demonstrated the basic characteristic of software being open. And what, by that, what I mean is uh, a lot of things that could be done well within the confines of the company, uh, software seems to be not one of those things necessarily. Some of it, yes, but a lot of it is being developed outside the uh, boundaries of the firm. And that has led to increasing interest in open source. And the technologies now that we see that use this open source paradigm uh, there, you know, initially operating systems like Linux were known, but no more. Now it has gone much beyond that. There's a lot of developments in a lot of technologies being championed by the open source environment or by the open source way of developing software. Um, now, I think most of you are familiar with it, but you know, just to give a, uh, you know, a very layman's introduction, open source is a way where people develop software voluntarily contributing code online. Now, there has been a lot of research. You know, people have said, why would someone do that? Why would you do it without getting paid and on and on? And there are a lot of motivations that are given for it. People want to learn, people want to get a reputation in the community, uh, enhance their extrinsic desires to showcase their talents 
but sometimes very intrinsic desires just to be a good citizen or desires that a lot of research uh, scholars have is to just contribute meaningful work or the work they think is meaningful, right? So open source, just brief background is that it used to be very much of a, uh, of a software, especially when I started uh, researching it and I started way back, uh, you know, when I just started my PhD, which is more than maybe 20 years now. So or around, around that time, 15 years. And that's when I started studying it. And initially it was restricted to uh, things that people would talk in the hallways, but never in the boardrooms. But that has changed as well. In the last few years, you name a company from Google to Dell to Motorola. And you know now even Microsoft uh, is pretty big into open source, which means that every company has realized it is hard to have a software development team and not rely on some aspects of software. So it, you know, it is very good, especially with IT, you know, the infrastructural technologies that go in the back end, uh, but, but also in the front end in many of the ways, uh, there are products that now integrate open source tools. And so, so that's the broad background of it. Having said that, although, you know, a lot of charm, a lot of interest these days is from people who are in the, uh, you know, in the corporate side of things, a lot of, uh, a lot of the, um, sorry, a lot of the initial, uh, and even, you know, now uh, development in the open source domain happens in a more bizarre like paradigm. And by that, uh, what we mean is the software development happens in uh, in a world that is very less managed. Now that is traditionally the strength of the software as well, which means uh, I think uh, some suggestion of a slide should. Uh, can you guys see the slides? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so most of the development happens in a bazaar like paradigm. Um, and most of the power of software development happens from that mode as well, which means that people are allowed to organically come together. People are allowed to organically contribute, collaborate, form teams. You know, if they want to, they do add value. If they don't, they just go away. But it happens organically with very little management if any and so that is the broader paradigm of uh, the open source uh, world but as a result of that what gives it an organic character what gives it a strength of you know creativity if you may that comes due to this organic development also gives it inefficiencies in terms of product development they're very distinct challenging dynamics um, you know a lot of products start uh, you know, i just listed here 500,000 projects and 3.7 million users in one repository alone. And, you know, th there are a lot more projects that get started, but never reach to a place where they would be usable, for example. And products really struggle to get customers and developers both. So how do we attract people who would be potential adopters of the, of the product, but also people who would contribute to it. So it's a, it's a very big challenge for especially newcomers because they do not have the corporate strength or processes that often are given in a proprietary environment. And so in that environment or in that context, what becomes very important is uh, how do you detect which products are going to be successful or not? Now, that was the broad overarching question for this research. So hopefully I've given uh, you know, enough background to sort of impress that that's an important idea. And the reason that is important is because unless we are able to detect uh, early success, market efficiency would continue to be low. Uh, and part of it is how do you allocate scarce resources? A lot of it is developer time, but also um, you know, important uh, you know, funding opportunities that might arise uh, or people just contributing their uh, you know, goodwill, if you may, to the projects. And that happens only to projects that seem to be do going somewhere, that seems to be having uh, some success in this marketplace, which is very bizarre like phenomena. A lot of people competing and a lot of people just not making it. And 
So it becomes very important from multiple perspectives to identify where do we allocate resources. And to do that, we need to identify what is the or which products are likely to be successful earlier than others. And so you can do their allocation accordingly. Um, not just the market efficiency, but the OSS products itself, the people who are making it, uh, are also interested in early success or determining factors that would lead them to early success. Uh, part of it is there's a first mover advantage who gets there. So, so who would become successful sooner is an important question. And uh, you know, to address that, what we in this research went after is how do we discern uh, how OSS products, which you know, and how they realize early success. And are there any systemic dy dynamics? There are systemic differences that we can unravel. So there are certain products that are likely to be more successful than others, right? Can we say that? And that was the question. So that is the question in this very broad, bizarre-like phenomena. Can we find certain products that are likely to be successful sooner than others? They would, you know, be categorized to be successful sooner than others. And you know, as some of you may have already guessed by now, the first challenge is, well, how do you define early success? Uh, what is success itself is a question that you know, it comes first. And then you talk about what is early success. Right? And so uh, what is success itself? There is an answer which comes from the domain of diffusion. And what, what that says is, um, you know, diffusion, again, for some of you, for a lot of you, that would be probably known, but diffusion is a very wide domain of uh, study, where diffusion of innovation initially, you know, some works, very influential works done by Rogers, his famous book in 1983, documented the diffusion of very many different things, including how, you know, uh, innovation spread in Africa, for example, and in places where there were not enough, uh, you know, resources to advertise or not enough channels. And so diffusion is a very well developed uh, domain, but it talks about how information diffuses and leads to the diffusion of innovation. And so, uh, you know, there is a whole lot of emphasis on social system, on the types of adopters, who will adopt early, who will adopt late. Uh, and, and then it categorizes different types of adopters. It categorizes the product catech or product characteristics uh, which products are likely to diffuse uh, you know, sooner than others, some that have greater relative advantage, some you know, that are perceived to be more innovative and so on and so forth. So a lot of those characteristics uh, have been studied in the diffusion literature. Um, again, some of you, like I said, may already be familiar with that research, but one of the things that is apparent in that domain of works, or one of the things that is clear from that domain of works is that uh, there is a diffusion curve and that is one of the very objective outcome of the literature that studies diffusion that there is a an s curve that is associated with diffusion of various products it has been established for automobiles microcomputers and so on and so forth and the basic idea is that early on the diffusion of products is very slow and then it takes off. And so to give you an example of what I'm talking about, this is an example of an S curve uh, in the domain of diffusion, uh, in the domain of open source. And these are two projects that we studied, CDX and Radeon. Uh, both of them have very different, uh, uh, both of them have very similar trajectory, although they you know, have very different characteristics. Otherwise they have very similar trajectory in the sense that there is an S curve where early on the uh, diffusion, in this case, it is measured as the number of downloads of the product itself is very less. And then it increases over time uh, after it takes off. And so there is, uh, there is a takeoff that happens, uh, which characterizes that the product now can be considered successful. It has taken off. And the reason we call it successful and the reason why that metric is very important in the OSS domain is because uh, takeoff helps the product separate itself from the crowd. So there are a lot of different products that I mentioned in the bazaar phenomena, which product gets more attention uh, depends on whether the product 
uh, has been able to take off or not. And so takeoff is an important milestone that would indicate that the product indeed has succeeded and, and differentiated itself from the, from the community uh, or differentiated itself from other products that are also competing in the same bazaar paradigm. Uh, anything that needs to be answered at this point? Am I clear, audible? Yes, no? Yeah, all good. Okay, great. Uh, so if takeoff is what is the indicator of success, our conclusion from the discussion was that if takeoff can be a mark of success, and it has been proved that way across products and categories, can we uh, identify early success as the time to take off? That was the uh, answer to this first challenge is, let us say that the takeoff or the time to take off represents early success, which means products that take off sooner uh, would be considered more successful than uh, others, uh, given everything else being the same, uh, which means that if you take a product or two products that are very similar otherwise, one that takes off sooner than the other, you would call that to be more successful than the other, given everything else uh, the same. And, and so that was the first answer. So, okay, we know now how do we measure or how do we assess early success? Our challenge too then was, well, what leads to early success? What would uh, ensure or what would trigger or reduce the time it takes for an OSS product to take off? And again, there are different ways you could have uh, you know, examined this whole thing. Uh, but what we relied on was this notion of signaling. And so what is signaling? Um, it's a theory basically is an information economics. Spence proposed it early on outside the domain of technology or open source. Um, as obviously it would have been 1973. Uh, Spence worked, uh, did get a Nobel Prize for it. Uh, the idea of uh, signaling, and it has been used in different domains, is that there are often, uh, you know, there are often things or entities for which the quality is unclear between providers and consumers. And, and this gap in understanding of quality is called information asymmetry, which means that I know something about the product quality that the other person may not. So famously applied in the context of education. And what it says there is that in the domain of education, you more clearly see that there are uh, times when people's degrees send signals as to how good a quality of employee they would be. And hence education credentials become a way for uh, a prospective uh, candidate to uh, to, its, to his or her employer, uh, telling them how good an employee uh, he or she would be, and, and that's the idea of um, you know signaling is that there are certain things that send signals. Now, this signaling has been studied in different domains. Akerlof studied it in the context of uh, you know buying old automobiles. And so the idea is, and you know his famous term is. Uh, there are bad lemons that you know you want to avoid and bad lemons means that the seller knows that the product is bad but the buyer does not and can fall into a trap of buying something that would be considered a bad lemon now um, there is also sometimes called a lemons problem it's usually is applicable to things that are more experienced and which means you cannot usually verify the quality of that product at the at the time you're buying it, it's only when you experience it over time that you understand the quality of that product. Uh, and, and it's otherwise very hard or rather impossible to find what the quality of that uh, product is. Now, uh, often in these cases, potential buyers or adopters look for certain signals. Um, they try to find out, you know, if you're buying an automobile, you might look for whether the car is making a lot of noise or whether the engine is sounding good. There's no way for you to know often, more often than not, although there are, you know, contexts where you may get testing done, where there might be a, uh, you know, 
a company that might be selling its used car with some certifications, etc. And part of it is all of those things send signal to the buyer that those, uh, you know, that the product that would otherwise be an experienced product would have certain quality that you can rely on and trust. Um, this is uh, more often than not true for software. In fact, much more true for software because its quality is even harder to verify. It's even harder to find out uh, which software product is going to go last longer, longer than not. Uh, any questions again? I, I, I you know, I, I think I did tell Kavita to hold the more substantive questions till the end, but if you have anything that, you know, you find intriguing or this thing, please do comment. I'll be glad to sort of answer or address in case there are any. Uh, but moving on, uh, the idea of signaling, uh, you know, applies in that case to the software products because software products are experiential, hard to find what, which, which one is uh, going to be uh, performing better, doing its job better. And it is for that reason that, you know, a lot of software companies you might have seen, including Microsoft, when they launch their windows, they do a very big launch and, you know, they're trying to send a signal that this is a you know very good product. Apple does it. Most of the other companies would do a launch, which is very um, uh, you know, elaborate, and, and they try to get a lot of hoopla around it to signal to the market that they're coming with a product in which they really believe and in which they really put a lot of effort, and it's a good quality. Uh, in general, though, beyond software, there are a lot of other ways that people send signals regarding product quality, be it advertising in general. Uh, be it the length of warranty they offer on products, uh, be it the free return policy, they may say to signal to people that they are very confident that the product is a good one. And so a lot of these things are used as signals for product quality and hopefully uh, add to success. Now, uh, the challenge is that open source is a slightly different context. And so this quote from Akerlof probably um, you know, summarizes what I am trying to communicate is, uh, that it is easy to resolve this problem of information asymmetry, which means buyers not knowing what sellers know about quality. It is easy to resolve it in certain uh, markets. Um, you know, let's say Microsoft's reputation, Microsoft comes out with a product. It's very easy to know, or you know, most people would believe it's a, it has certain level of quality that they can expect. Uh, but in other markets, asymmetric information between buyers and sellers is not easily soluble and results in serious market breakdowns. And so it's really important to understand how in open source uh, one might send signals. And, and you know, I think you've already guessed by now that open source products lack the credibility if you compare it, for example, with something like Microsoft. It would not have the kind of credibility uh, for a typical open source product. And when I say an open source product, I'm, you, know, you may conceptualize uh, something that is competing itself in the market of you know 500,000 product you know market and stuff like that. So smaller kind of vendors or smaller developers may not have the kind of credibility that you know Microsoft may have, uh, and it and they may lack formal corporate communication processes to do the wide scale advertising or send signals that would be um, influential or important. So it's very hard to uh, for some of these products to even do the kind of advertising that large corporate players might be easily able to do. And so traditional instruments, uh, advertising and others might have a breakdown, they may not work as well. And because of the lack of established brand names, marketing activities, and you know, lack of any prior reputation for some of these developers as well. Um, and and so, so some of those challenges are pretty strong in the open source community. Uh, now, given that context, our question was, how do we then or how do an open source product send signal to the community regarding the uh, regarding the okay i have a couple of questions i think i'm going to go there but let me finish this train of thought uh, so the quality itself uh, so how do you send signals to the open source community uh, about the quality of your product if you're an open source product developer and, and what kind of signaling may work. Right? And I think there are a couple of questions from Karthikin and the question is for the metric to determine success, is it sufficient to look at number of downloads? Uh, and for a credible signal to be sent, 
the signaler should have the ability to acquire the signal at lower cost than others in the case of this. How is the function done? Okay. Uh, let me address. So on the on your first question, Karthik, and the the uh, there is usually uh, there is usually downloads is one well known metric. Uh, in our previous research, we used actually two of them. One was page views, and the other is downloads. And uh, the two represent different uh, sort of measures of success. Uh, page views was considered in our analysis a little bit more often. Uh, you know, so there is a there's a model, well-known model in marketing, which says IDA, awareness is interest and, and then ends with an action. Uh, and in our you know, previous research and, and you know, in other works similar, often two types of uh, variables are used as indicators of uh, success. So one is paid views, which, is, which would give you how much were the people interested in the product and downloads indicate that to some extent they were uh, more keen to um, so it, it represents a more in-depth assessment after which you've decided to download the product With, because there are more costs for the person who's downloading cost in terms of whether the software will be reliable whether it might have malware and other things a download represents a much more uh, or much stronger uh, metric for success and and there is a whole bit of research done by Krauston uh, on, on different measures of success. So there are multiple uh, of those and downloads is often considered to be one of the more reliable ones in the open source community. Uh, having said that, it's not the only one for sure. There are many others, but it is considered one of the more reliable ones. Uh, on their second question, uh, for a credible signal to be sent. So there's a, there's a full theory to be uh, you know, so what is a what is a credible signal, right? So that's a that's a question that is it's a very good question as to what makes a signal credible. And, and so to answer that, you know, let me go back to Spence, uh, who first said that what is a signal? Signal by nature is something that either accidentally or by design it, it conveys some information that alters the beliefs of the individuals in the market. So. If it signals, if it gives some indication that uh, you know is is important enough for the potential adopter to make up their mind, then it's a signal. Now there are two uh, criteria that the signaling literature says are important for a signal to be meaningful. One is that it should be openly observable, which means that people should be able to uh, you know see it, assess it, etc. And the second is that the signal should be costly to obtain. It should not be easy to obtain. And uh, it is from that perspective that we said that the community of OSS developers uh, is their actions or their activities do send meaningful signals to the product. And so uh, the idea, the basic idea there is that uh, there are a lot of products that come in the open source uh, environment and there's always a lot of scarcity of developers uh, who would be willing to contribute or who will be willing to participate on these products. And given that scarcity, given that um, you know, community itself is not easy in terms of accessibility for the product uh, that you know, wants to send such a signal, any community contribution becomes a source of a signal. Any meaningful contribution, and, and again, I want to bring you back to the uh, you know, context here. We're talking about a vast range of products uh, and not just you know, a, a few well-known names like Linux or Apache, but, but a vast range of products which may never, some of, many of which may never see the light of the day, many of which may just uh, you know, linger on and so on. And so in that context, any contributions made by community to a product, uh, they do send some signal. So it is as basic as that, you know, more in-depth contributions would make even more impact. But in our case, uh, what we said was that the community of developers who are actively participating in developing the product may be a valid source of sending signals for two reasons, for two criteria. One is their signals are costly to obtain and they're openly observable because their activities are usually in the, especially the platform we were looking at source codes, they were uh, openly observable. And so, so that is the context, that is the background from which we came uh, and uh, 
came to this idea that signals by community of OSS developers may send uh, important information to potential adopters. Uh, Karthikeyan, does that answer your question, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you. So I was basically trying to build an analogy with the warranty uh, signaling paradigm. So uh, is it okay for me to talk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So I was thinking, uh, so would I be right if I said uh, for an organization to get a, a collection of coders to work on an open source project would be more difficult than to hire these coders and then make them work um, on, a, on a paid project such as say Finical or something like that. So th that would be the comparison. So on the one hand, it's more expensive to extract such energies from those people, uh, from uh, software programmers. But on the other hand, uh, wouldn't a, uh, it, it's also uh, more difficult to pay someone to do the job when you know the cash, cash flows in the future are uncertain. So, um, so I, I could argue both ways. So I was just thinking because this presents a very interesting um, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I think that's very interesting. Actually, uh, we are working on another project as part of these open source sort of developers and you know their contributions and why they contribute. And Linux actually did a survey recently. And it was probably 5,000 open source developers this survey. And you know, it was done with another company, I think it's Dice, uh, Linux and Dice. So they did a survey of open source participants and developers. And uh, you know, you'd be surprised to see that. I think only 3% said that money was a motivation to contribute. And, and it's not, for majority of them, it's the respect they get in the community. It is the uh, learning they get from working on new technology and just the exhilaration of doing the cutting edge work. And a lot of them find it from that perspective. Those motivations are very similar and, and it's not new. In research, it has been documented for years now that open source developers mostly are very different from proprietary developers. Uh, and, and, you know, so, so there is a lot of competition these days to get these developers by the corporates. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the reason for that is that they don't want to, you know, get a product and then pay license fees for it or, you know, maintain. So they said, why not hire the person who's familiar with the, with the technology if we're going to use the technology. So there's a lot of interest in getting these guys by the corporations. But, but it's a different challenge to find how to motivate them because they're not like normal developers motivated just by money. Uh -huh. And so, so, so yeah, yeah, it's a very different world there. And especially in these, uh, you know, the kind of projects we're talking about, which may not be corporate sponsored. In fact, it is, um, it is, it, you know, it, it's even more challenging as to how do you get someone because why would they work on your project? Why would they be keen? Well, you know, yeah. So therefore, it's more costly, and hence the credibility. Right. Right. Yeah. right. So that's why it's very costly to obtain. It's not easy to get these signals, and uh, and, and and whatever activities they do are clearly observable, and so that makes it um, you know much um, sort of convincing signal to the potential adopters about the quality. And and mind you, you know most of these open source products develop actually within or through the community contributions. And so these people are uh, more familiar, people who are in the community are more familiar about the quality of the product itself. And so they have the legitimacy to send those signals. Right. Uh, because if they worked on it, you know, there would be, and that's another thing, you know, one of the other challenge you know, we face in this research in general is quality itself is a very nebulous characteristic. So what is quality of a product? That's very hard to say, especially if a software product it becomes even harder. Uh, but even in general, uh, quality has been debated even uh, outside, you know, even in the non-software world. And I say non-software world because if you're thinking about a car, you would think that the quality is more observable or more objectively definable. Yeah. Uh, but that's not true. You know, there's there's a lot of discussion even in the operations management literature on um, and 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 a lot of confusion or a lot of sort of consensus is that the quality is often unobserved and and there and you know, people have even said that there is no such thing as objective quality it's only perceived quality as perceived by someone and, and so quality itself is hard to determine but in that environment where we're talking about um, you know what is quality uh, you know usually people use terms like fitness 
of use, whether the product is fit to be used, whether the you know whether it meets two characteristics. Usually, people say whether it meets the technical criteria and the functional criteria. And, and again, those could vary, but at least there is some sort of understanding that when you're thinking of quality, the community of participants would largely be familiar with technical and functional uh, criteria that are typical of that project. So, for example, you know, if you're building a communication app. You know, community might know what are the main features or functions that should be there in a communication app. They might also be know the kind of technical standards that such an app should meet. And then can you know, comment or, or through their activities send signals as to whether these uh, criteria regarding technical and functional characteristics are met or not. And, and that's, the, uh, that's the role of community sending signals to the potential adopters. So that, that was a very good discussion. Thank you, Kartikin. Any other questions or doubts? I have just one. Oh, sure. Okay, if I ask one more question. Sure, go ahead. So, uh, in the past, Microsoft had uh, announced that it would also uh, start investing in the open source ecosystem um, and would start incorporating open source in its products as well. So, uh, now given that there can be two different types of uh, companies that can do software, one is a rigid corporate hierarchy like Microsoft and another is like a bunch of coders who got together and started coding. Uh, there's definitely some history to Microsoft which would suggest that you don't want to believe Microsoft is in the open source right. system. Right? So I, I was thinking when I read that article uh, about Microsoft coming in, I just couldn't believe it. I was like, it's not possible for Microsoft to do this, whereas for Google, you're willing to believe that Google is open source. So, uh, yeah, so I, I was just wanting to ask for your comments on that. No, I think <laughs> this is a, this is probably the talk of you know these contemporary times. People, you know, if you read articles today, say that even the enemies of open source, like Microsoft and you know to some extent Expedia, are now in the open source domain, and that's you know, typically the talk of the you know of the of the day. I think I think the open source movement has gone beyond their control. So they are sort of co-opting it or trying to get into it because I think I, I think it's more pragmatic for them. I don't know if their philosophy may have changed, but their yeah, pragmatism yeah. makes them go there. And so and and to be frank, Microsoft itself is evolving with the kind of leaders and you know the leadership and all that changing. So there might be some changes in culture as well. I mean, who knows? Such a big organization, it's hard to see which parts have changed and which parts haven't. Uh, it's you know those are very big beasts and they may have you know very very highly conflicting ideologies even within the company and some parts might say that's okay some others might say it's not acceptable to them and so on and so forth so you're right Microsoft is not typically you know I mean it's totally anti it was anti and it's 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 sort of doubtful but I think it's more of a pragmatic step for them. They might boost it because whenever they go and they have, you know, anybody who's going there may have budgets to, you know, encourage community participation, this, that. I mean, that's how they usually approach and do things. Uh -huh. Having said that, you know, I, I, the jury is still out on how much they would contribute to the open source itself, or it's, it's just that they will be using it for their own good, I guess. Yeah. So, for instance, a general game theoretical setup where you have a signaler and a screener. Um, let's say in the publishing game which we are all in uh, you you see that many journals want your want their code on stata and not on uh, r or uh, python so uh, python and r being open source ecosystems and definitely they are signaling a certain type of quality but within that uh, screening game you don't really have any credibility for r code right so I haven't, uh, so I haven't come across people saying we want to accept code in a certain form, but maybe there is some of that going on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm digressing. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't, uh, but maybe there is something like that. You know, there might be some courses. Uh, I mean, these yes. old players do have. I mean, they are seeing their monopoly go away with a lot of code on Python and R becoming very good in terms of analysis and stuff. Right. Breaking their business model. But okay, well, continuing with that, unless there are any other questions or. That's, that's it.
anyone else has anything to add or ask or something? Okay, but in that case, uh, yeah, let's move on to the, uh, you know, the storyline on this paper was, so when we said that community of OS is developers as a way to send signals, the next question was what kind of signals will you send? And, you know, in a, we had done some work previously many years ago where we had studied um, what are the type of community activities that are associated with quality. And, um, you know, we found that some of the OSS participants, especially the peripheral participants, were very good in uh, assessing product quality and enhancing quality as well. And so those are the two different activities that community of developers would participate or contribute to. Uh, product quality assessment is indicative of, uh, you know, if they found any bug, for example, finding bugs, for example. Uh, or finding any, or, you know, raising any feature request. And so, you know, whether they say that the certain features are missing in the product. And then there are certain uh, activities that would be considered uh, good for quality enhancement. Uh, let's say if they're doing a version release or a bug fix, for example, uh, we found that having, you know, community developers uh, helps in those two activities. That was our earlier research. So we built off of that logic and said that there are two types of signals that would come you know, out uh, of an open source product. One is a signal of quality deficiency, which would indicate whether the product lacks in any way, uh, you know, in quality, uh, any signal to that effect. And, and our goal was that any activity, even if there is one activity, even if there is a single activity that sends that signal, uh, that could influence takeoff. And then if there is a signal which uh, indicates that community is participating in the improvement of the product. And so those two characteristics we thought would be uh, influential in influencing the takeoff of the open source product. Um, why would SQD or you know signal of quality deficiency matter? So signal of quality deficiency, specifically if, if there is a bug you know, being found or if there is a request for features, et cetera, that's pending, uh, indicates uh, it is a signal about the readiness of the product. That's how we kind of saw it, that products might signal uh, or the com such community activities might signal that the product right now is not ready to be usable. And, and such a signal is reliable because there is no alternate you know, unlike other domains where you would see that there are, um, you know, there, there are other verification mechanisms for quality. Um, you know, if you are having a product coming out of an established corporation, you know, maybe Google or something, they might have work teams for product testing. They might have, uh, and those processes are well known. You know, they might have credibility around those work teams. And so, in absence of such mechanisms, a signal of quality deficiency indicates a reliable report that indicates there will be greater adoption costs for anybody who's adopting such product, which means it'll be expensive for them. They might have to spend more on the learning costs. Uh, once they make their processes or once they start doing work with this software, the software itself may not be very um, you know, useful or it might have a breakdown or it might not be uh, functionally uh, meeting the requirements of the task that the person is trying to use it for and so on and so forth. So there might be uh, you know, things that are lacking in that software is what is indicative of that, uh, of that particular software. And any such bug report would at least reduce the rate at which the product is going to be adopted, which means that fewer people will adopt it or some many would delay their adoption decisions uh, if they if they find that there is a there is some signal that the product may not yet be ready to be adopted and uh, and so uh, so that's one uh, reason why the product will take longer to acquire the critical mass that is required for it to take off so remember the takeoff is you know, if you go back to the diffusion curve, the takeoff happens when there are enough people uh, to create a critical mass so that after that point, the product continues to have higher rate of adoptions, which means 
that you know there is a usually in an open source environment more than the proprietary environment there is a uh, there is a, a a lot of role there is a major role to be played by word of mouth and i think there was some research which found um, it was uh, you know comparing linux and windows nt and and, and and what was found was that the rate of uh, you know what is the effect of word of mouth is much stronger in the case of linux than it is in the case of windows nt now both of them being operating system other things being same uh, there, this was a remarkable sort of comparison that you know word of mouth is more influential this was a work by dalian julian i think in 1999 who studied and found that you know, there was a difference between these uh, these different uh, uh, products in the word of mouth being influential. So, so the critical mass is not acquired. There is a bug, it creates a negative word of mouth. People will say, well, that product is not so good. So it slows down the acquisition of critical mass beyond which the product might just continue to have a higher rate of adoptions. And as a result, it takes longer. It, you know, the takeoff times are longer. It takes longer for the product to see the takeoff. And that is why SQD or the signal of quality deficiency is said to have a negative influence on the time it takes for the product to take off. So that was the uh, that was the um, you know sort of um, context or, or, or learning from that. And then the quality improvement itself, uh, we said, could have a very different effect, and in this case, a positive effect which means it could shorten the time it takes for the product to take off. And, and you know, this, this again comes from some of the work we had done before as well. We found that it is important in the open source context, if you have to get uh, a product to do well, it has to continue to improve because it's very uncertain market. Not many products do that well. And so for a product to do well, the potential adopters have to feel or sense that this product is likely to continue to do well over time. And, 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 and the reassurance for that is that the product will continue to evolve and develop. That happens only when you see some indication of quality improvements uh, happening on the product already. And the reason how that is indicative of future improvements is because any improvement in the open source, you know, requires a lot of interactions between Sometimes it is the core versus peripheral developers, which means there will be community contributing. And then there are core group of developers who might be in charge of the project. And then both of them may be coordinating their expertise to actually lead to a, a final development of a particular uh, product or a particular patch or a particular version that is released. And so if there is an improvement in the product, it sends a signal that the quality improvement is ongoing and will happen in future. And that, that the product has certain governance mechanisms in place, which are required to coordinate the expertise of these developers. And given the presence of those you know, mechanisms, the product is likely to continue to uh, you know, succeed or continue to grow. Uh, and, and hence, that makes that product gain a competitive advantage over its competitors, which means if the potential adopters are comparing certain products, they would like to think that, uh, that the product that has a quality improvement signal will do better. Now, I'm gonna go to the next slide, but let me ask a question. You know, let's see what people here think about. I'm gonna talk about a moderating impact. I'm gonna say that these signals have a different influence for products that are targeted to different audiences. And I'm going to say that there are two different types of audience. There is end user and there are developers, which means that there are certain open source products that are targeted to end users. And there are certain others that are targeted to developers. Which type of product do you think will see a greater impact of the signals, both the signals, SQD SQD and SQI?
okay quality improvement and users well uh, to make it simple let me give you a, a tip both signals uh, you know okay well let's not give the tip i think that's good what you're saying let's hear what others also have to say so our results are very interesting anybody else wants to comment on uh, you know whether you think uh, signals would do better the developer focused products or end user focused products which will your uh, while people are thinking uh, which will your 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 comment is well taken uh, but traditionally open source you know people hate microsoft maybe it's not the other way around maybe it's one way but the general perception is microsoft has gone after open source products and not like them uh, and usually considered the enemy of you know, open source or at least that's the perception that it doesn't like anything that one of the things and so some of these things you know are like i said in a large corporation sometime there are all ends there are all you know sides of the coin and microsoft has some very fine developers too but yeah there is there's broadly a perception that microsoft did not like oss and that, like i said that might be a perception among the open source community more than anything else okay uh, well let me move on then to the mostly available freely as well but then free is a very you know loaded word what is free uh, uh, but yeah to some extent yes but not necessarily so you know there is a lot of complexity in that you know word free as to what is free to what extent it's used is free and to what extent it's not so the free and the cost itself those are very big major sort of elements to discuss as well uh, but yeah let me get you to the uh, let me get get you to this moderating impact so our theory on the moderating impact was that when you think of oss products some of them are user focused the others are developer focused uh, the and, and the difference is that End users usually have limited technical knowledge, especially their ability to assess products, architecture, design, code is less. And, uh, and in that sense, there is research which has shown that people who are more knowledgeable about a product or who have themselves have their ideas about what is good quality product and what is not, uh, those uh, kind of developers those kind of sort of potential adopters are rather quick uh, or rather rely on their own judgment instead of the judgments of the uh, of the community in this case or instead of the judgment of anybody else so if you are a developer and you have the ability to evaluate the product yourself signals become less effective what that means is and, and we argue that both of them will become attractive and you'll see in a short while actually our results are not what we hypothesize there's slight difference and slight surprising finding there we did not find both of them to be equally effectively or equal equally less effective but uh, we do see that a signal of uh, you know so according to our logic both of them would be less effective for developer targeted products because developers would have their own mind they would use their own assessment to determine whether they want to adopt the product or not. And cumulatively, there will be less effective signals. Uh, and with that logic, what we would say is that ordinarily an SQD will have a longer take of time for uh, products to end users as compared to those targeted to developers because developers are not influenced by those signals. And so it has lesser effect of slowing down the time to take off. Uh, for developer targeted projects and similarly for sqi it will have shorter time for products targeted to end users as compared to developers because again developers are going to use their own uh, kind of metric to evaluate and they will not be signals themselves will have lesser effect in those cases it will be just the product itself and 
we had another, you know, and I'll show you the results in the next few slides as to what we found. And it was interesting how the finding actually are not exactly what we what we thought would happen. And, and, and that's a little interesting, you know, part of this research is uh, also that, you know, how these signals operate differently. Uh, but then we looked at another aspect and that aspect was that we found that uh, the open source products innovativeness and the idea in innovativeness is that most products by nature, you know, they are innovations. And so if you go by the Rogers um, model of diffusion of innovation, uh, more innovative products are likely to diffuse faster. People are going to like, you know, most uh, products that are more innovative compared to those that are less innovative. Uh, but then uh, the signals themselves we thought had would have different effects. And the logic there is that uh, innovativeness usually may lend a type of a halo effect to the product itself. People are likely to find more innovative products so appealing or they're so in awe, if you may, of such products. And Apple had done it a lot of time by its design uh, you know, convincing people of quality uh, in, in many ways. And so when you have a product that has, that is perceived to be more innovative, it has an effect which creates a halo about quality of multiple different aspects, technical and functional people perceive it to be better. And it is that perception uh, that would uh, often lead to uh, people to have a, uh, you know, a, a, a more, positive view of the product itself and which means that the signals uh, are less effective the information asymmetry decreases the moment you find or you trust the quality or you have your own indication of what the quality is you have less perception of how much you don't know and so you feel you know that it is going to be good there is that perception of it being good already and once you have that perception it is hard to rely on signals for an assessment of the product uh, itself. You rely on that hello that has been created because you find more innovative product to generally be perceived of greater quality. And so because of that hello effect, uh, a more innovative product uh, will lead to have lesser effect of both SQD and SQI. And what that means is a longer take of time for OSS products that are not innovative, uh, which means that SQD is really effective uh, in communicating that product is not ready. But people tend to ignore that when the product is very innovative, they pay less attention to a signal which says the product may not be ready. It gets less uh, important in people's evaluations and they tend to find the product to be more acceptable to them. Uh, similarly, a signal of quality improvement uh, may lead to shorter takeoff time uh, because, uh, you know, for not innovative products, because that's where signal really has power. If product is innovative, it really has less influence and people are you know, generally not paying much attention to that at all. So, so that was our four sets of hypotheses. We said the signals matter, both quality deficiency and innovative uh, improvement, both will reduce the time it takes for a product to take off. And we said that their influence will be different across one, the products that are focused to different users, uh, end users versus developers, and products that have different level of innovativeness. So that is the whole model. That was the whole theory that we were trying to test. And to test that, we, you know, this was project was started a while back. And so we used web crawlers at that time. There were not so many projects on source code. So we collected data about 1,000 projects. And after some cleaning, we found 941 projects to be usable. So that was our sort of data collection in, in that time. Now, what is interesting is uh, the takeoff itself. So one of the key idea that we were doing in this research is to identify takeoff which is the metric of early success uh, or you know, time to take off as a metric for early success. And we found uh, different ways that are often used and we use them uh, to assess takeoff. One is purely visual inspections. You can see an S curve. You can see how the product is taking off. That's a pretty good indication. But then there's a maximum growth rule where you find that 
which is the first time, let's say, the product doubles in terms of number of downloads, would be an indication. And then there is another discriminative analytic approach, which we also used in this research to uh, verify that our measure of takeoff was appropriate. And so those are the three methods that we used. Um, we did find uh, differences, um, but I'll come to that in a, in a second. Um, the SQD and SQI, both of these were measured, as I indicated before, as signals about quality. And because of that focus on quality, uh, we use both technical and functional aspects, which means uh, there was a technical uh, measure of quality and then there was a functional and both of them, either of them, if was indicated or if was present, it was said that the, that the product has a signal uh, in this case uh, of deficiency, it was either a bug report or a feature request. In the case of SQI, which is the improvement signal, the indicators were whether there was a version release or there is a bug fix. And so those were the indicators of uh, quality. Uh, in our sample, uh, about 30% had some sort of an SQD, either of the two, either technical deficiency or uh, functional deficiency, uh, as indicated by the community activity, obviously, whether the community has indicated or the community has performed any activity that would indicate a technical or a functional deficiency. Uh, similarly, we categorize the products as having SQI if they had a bug fix or a version release, and 70% of the products had it like I just said. Um, there was, uh, you know, just from the, you know, without any analysis, there seemed to be, um, you know, some uh, benefit of having an SQI uh, more than uh, of comparing uh, having an SQD in the sense of time to take off. And, uh, you know, so they, those were the descriptive statistics of which I kind of shared here. But then we did a formal analysis. And in this case, we used a Cox proportional hazard model to see whether the probability or the time to take off decreases if uh, or increases depending on uh, the presence of one of these signals. And this was the prox proportional hazard model and the results. Uh, we uh, found support for our hypotheses as you would see here uh, for the main hypothesis. So signals perform the way we expected them to, which means the quality deficiency signal does make it longer for the product to take off and the quality improvement signal uh, reduces the time for a product to take off. So those results were as expected. What was not as expected and surprising to us was that we did not find SQD to have a different effect across the type of product, neither on the based on the type of uh, you know, end user or neither the, based on the on the potential users of the product, whether it is end user or developer, both of them found SQD to be similarly negative. And, and, and that's interesting uh, in itself. Um, but SQI on the other hand, does have an effect across the two uh, moderators in this case, across the two, you know, whether the products are targeted to end users or developers, or whether the products are more innovative or less innovative, the effects of those two signals, SQD and SQI, change. However, the effects of um, uh, the uh, SQD don't, which means it is negative, but it remains to be similarly negative across both the uh, cases in this case. Uh, and so in this case, what we find was that, you know, SQD really, if you go back to what we said earlier, SQD is uh, about raising a doubt on the quality of the product itself. Uh, and you know, if it indicates the product is not ready, I think everybody gets it for that reason. And part of it is, I think in open source, you know, as we think harder about it, in open source, a lot of products start with an innovative idea as it is commonly known that it is to desire to satisfy a personal itch, what Raymond called it. Raymond is you know, the guy who wrote Cathedral and the Bazaar, the famous book around open source. And his description is that uh, the desire to satisfy a personal itch is what triggers uh, uh, anybody to start an open source project. But then taking it through to fruition 
and you know putting around processes that lead for it to grow i think it, there's a lot of perception that many products are not good and and you know many products just are not serious and it is in that sense that if you find an sqd it seems to have a universal impact on both developers and end users and irrespective of who they are people are finding it to be equally bad in some sense right so that's the so that is the uh, you know our explanation for the missing impact uh, of the moderating influences on sqd which is the quality deficiency signal which is equally strong in both the cases uh, but in the case of sqi we do not find uh, the non effect of these two in fact the products do have different effects uh, any questions on this so far everything good any doubts questions we are doing good okay but in that case you know finally uh, to the last stage of the presentation uh, there are a couple of ways we thought we've done you know some contributions or added some value uh, one is that most of the previous paradigms of technology adoption are you know use or rely on some sort of measures of technology adoption and the previous researchers have largely used this decision making stages in uh, sort of let me just finish this train of thought and i'll come back to your question uh, so there is uh, you know there is you know me measures and metrics are at the heart of technology adoption and and there are many different ways that people have used it people have looked at behavioral intentions of adopters uh, people have looked at um, you know, within the organization routinization of innovations and so on and so forth decision making stages so what we've tried to do is we've tried to give a different paradigm of uh, adoption in this case which is focused around you know, this whole idea of life cycle of product etc and i'll come back to that life cycle comment in a few as well and largely not just the general technology adoption but i think in the oss research as well people have looked at and i think your point earlier uh, was that whether downloads is sufficient so people have used that number of users popularity views of information pages even downloads and crowston like i said has a summary of these different measures as well that have been used um, um and, and and so we've added some value to it by not just looking at downloads because downloads are sometimes a lot more influenced by the type of product by you know if, if a product is such that it is, has a more mass appeal or it has a greater market share or more more larger number of potential market uh, you know adopters it's going to have a lot more downloads so sometimes it's hard to compare downloads across products if they are in different categories for example and uh, and so some of those uh, you know things that i think we've done here uh, our takeoff measure has fixed and before i come back to actually more of these let me take the comment by sora uh, sort of just to clarify are you saying that platform communities become bigger and bigger uh, in the sense that the projects become bigger or the number of projects on the platform become bigger uh, people contributing to one single project you're saying is that okay okay yeah so i think there are a lot of examples of those like linux and others and uh, so sort of maybe just hold for a second let me uh, come back to it my my simple answer short answer right now and i'll just elaborate on it in the next few slides as well is um, the implications you know our study was to a large scale project where we looked at even a very tiny signal of deficiency or improvement matters that's what the study was saying and uh, you know to some extent it is more that even when a small signal matters how much would a large one matter and so to answer your question if you are let's say having three different operating system linux being one of them or you know, if you're dealing with three different mobile you know, 
technologies for certain things. Uh, and with, these are large projects, let's say. Signals of quality deficiency may still matter. The concept itself would still matter. And it, 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 is, about, it is about the type of signal might be different. It may not be just one indication of quality deficiency that might be enough for a person to decide to either use it or not use it. It might be more substantial signal saying that the quality is usable or not. That's what my short answer is, but let me come back to this and expand on it in terms of, um, you know, what is, so let me ask one question here before I, you know, when I get to that level, how many here are, uh, maybe is there a way to do a show of hands here in terms of how many are PhD students or research and how many are not? Can we do a show of hands in any way? Perhaps not. Okay. 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 I should have done this probably at the start of the presentation to get a better sense, but uh, okay. Anybody else wants to? I see a couple of names familiar, but uh, that's fine. I think uh, some intent that some, so, okay. Let me come back to that point, which well, uh, oh, sorry, Saurabh, sorry, and uh, you know, what, what we, so in terms of contribution, and I'll explain on that, uh, you know, when, when we were developing this takeoff, what we hope we've done to technology adoption research is given a new paradigm where there are less personal reporting bias, even when we ask somebody, uh, you know, that the project development stage, even that is reported by project leaders. So we don't know what kind of, um, you know, that, uh, what is the, uh, you know, what, what is the effect, whether that report is in fact valid or not. And so there's a lot of bias that might come in because of the, you know, personal reporting. And in this case, takeoff is not personally reported. It is objective measure in that sense, which is not influenced, like I said before, by even the target market size. It's a life cycle based measure, which means it is presumed that most organizations or most, most products go through a similar uh, curve, uh, the same S curve. And so at some point in time, they go to the life cycle. So one can even compare products that are very different operating in different market categories to see which one took off earlier. And the time to take off is independent of some time there uh, market size as well. It, it is a standard measure of, uh, you know, objective measure of, of success in that sense. Um, there are, uh, you know, there, there is a, uh, there is a lot of theories that are based on individual behaviors. Uh, we know theory of reasoned action, theory of planned behaviors and such. Um, And then there are uh, theories of, you know, uh, product uh, characteristics such as relative advantage, observability, triability, fallibility, the characteristics of the product itself. Uh, there are theories that talk about organizational dynamics, knowledge-based view of the firm, institutional theory, et cetera, resource-based view, you know, technology, TOE frameworks and such. And, uh, and there are theories that use the network, you know, the Rogers definition of innovation, which is largely this one is based on. But what we've presented is a more of a product life cycle theory within the diffusion aspect, where we've been able to show that there is, um, there's a life cycle based measure that can be assessed and determined using signals as an approach to, uh, to assess what the adoption patterns are, et cetera. So um, the final, you know, a message that I think I would say and maybe address sort of comment a little bit more in depth is uh, the goal and what we tried to do in this research was to build, uh, you know, is to build a theory which is a scientific theory for early success. So that is the objective of this. Now this theory was set in the open source context. The environment is open source. The domain is open source but it is a theory for early success. And so uh, what we are, uh, what we've been able to do is uh, 
lay down certain principles, find certain relations, find certain characteristics in that domain that influence early success. Having said that, you know, sort of answering your question, even when there is larger projects or even as the platforms become bigger, whether early success will be influenced by signals of quality deficiency and improvement. Uh, I think that's still an open question, but I would venture out to say yes. Uh, though the type of signal might be different, we may not get the uh, you know, similar uh, signal, which is just whether there was an, a contribution of code, whether there was a contribution of quality uh, to quality or not, but it, it is, you know, it is whether there was a signal about deficiency and whether there was a signal about improvement or not. Just two aspects, I think, is what we've highlighted. And those, my uh, guess or my you know, uh, assumption would be would matter even when there are larger projects or even when the projects are larger. Uh, and I would say even beyond open source, this would be valid to other virtual communities. There are many of them now. Uh, producing knowledge, raising finances, uh, sharing knowledge, you know, all these different communities. Open source is a community to share and build code. Uh, but there are other communities that share different things and build different aspects. So I would say that these things are valid and applicable even in those other virtual communities, uh, which means that signals of quality, yeah, uh, Kaggle, for example, Kaggle, Kaggle is more of competition, uh, but yes, it does. Uh, as a model which is similar in some way to contributions by community, uh, whether the deficiency and all. So Kaggle is slightly different, uh, but not too much, only slightly. And so, so yeah, I mean, all those communities, I think our core model might still be applicable. So I think uh, Kavita is asking for last questions. We want to wrap up soon. If you have any, or if you want to you know, discuss anything, please go ahead. I'm going to just stop here. I think I just wanted to cover that. Thank you. Any last questions or comments or anything? I guess we've been having a lot of questions along the way. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. Been quite an interactive talk that way. Very good. Well, thank you all for coming. It was uh, it was a great uh, pleasure interacting with you. Uh, I hope uh, this was useful and gave you some ideas. If you have questions later, feel free to write to me about this or anything else. Uh, you're always welcome to write to me. My email IDs are around. Uh, send me a note and I'll be glad to respond or interact with you if required. And nothing else, then have a good night and see you around sometime. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to formally thank uh, uh, Pankaj for taking out this time for a very interesting talk. And uh, of course, uh, it's quite uh, good to see so much uh, interaction and a lot of wonderful questions coming up as well. Thank you, Pankaj, and uh, look forward to more talks like this. Thank you. Thank you, Kavita, and thank you, everyone else.